Hi guys, I hope I'm audible and visible to all of you. Could someone just give me a yes so that I know I'm audible and visible? Hi, good morning. Hi, Manchu, Jatin. So we just <clears throat> wait for a couple of minutes before we start off. Awesome. So what we're going to discuss in uh, today's session is the Bitcoin white paper. And I'm going to try to go into as much detail as possible. Let me just, yeah. So I'm going to go into it in as much detail as possible. The objective being, let's understand all the technological terms and concepts that are there in this uh, white paper. And whatever questions you guys have, keep putting them in the chat. And I'll keep answering them from time to time. But just make sure the questions are related only to the Bitcoin white paper. We'll talk about other issues later, but right now only on the white paper. So great, I can see a lot of you are ready. Let me just start sharing my screen. So when we look at a white paper, it very clearly says that Bitcoin is a peer to peer electronic cash system. So that was the vision with which this white paper was written. And that is why when we look at what's really happened to Bitcoin today, where first of all, it's being used as a store of value. Secondly, it is being made available on so many centralized exchanges. So we realize that that's not actually the vision that the creators had. Their vision was very simple. Firstly, it's peer to peer. So you're not really supposed to be using centralized exchanges. Secondly, it's an electronic cash system. And you are not supposed to hold on to cash as a store of value because the value of cash is actually supposed to fall over time. If you look at the conventional economics and Bitcoin's being invented as a medium of exchange. So anyway, that's the introduction to it. Now let's have a look at the abstract of the paper. Now it says, right on top, a purely peer-to-peer -peer version of electronic cash would allow online payments to be sent directly from one party to another without having to go through a financial institution, right? But they realize that there is a big issue called double spending, which they need to solve. So that's the first thing that we really need to understand that what do we mean by double spending? So when you look at a physical currency note, you cannot spend it twice because the moment you spend it, you're giving it away to someone else. Now you can't spend it anymore. But when we look at a virtual currency, it's an electronic record. I mean, just try to take a very simple example, let's say of a Word document. If I give you a Word document in which I've written, I will pay you 100 rupees. Now you make 10 copies of that. All 10 copies will be identical. And now you can say, I owe you 1000 rupees. Why? Because you made 10 copies of a 100 rupee document. So this issue of how do we prevent a digital currency or a virtual currency from being spent more than once, that is called the double spending problem. And for the first time in the world, that problem was solved by the Bitcoin white paper. And that is the reason we say that the main innovation of Bitcoin is a method of using technology to prevent double spending. I hope that's clear to all of you. If you have questions, keep putting them on the screen. I do not see any questions here. Okay. Now let's head back to the abstract. So we understood basically what double spending means. Now, what is a Bitcoin white paper suggesting? So it's saying that we are proposing a solution to the double spending problem using firstly a peer to peer network. So you will have a huge number of nodes or computers connected to each other and there is no centralized server. So it is not like everyone needs to connect to one central server. Everyone connects to everyone else. So it's a peer to peer kind of a network. Now, what does that network do? And this is the most critical part. The network timestamps transactions by hashing them onto an ongoing chain of hash based proof of work, forming a record that cannot be changed without redoing the proof of work. So actually, honestly speaking, if you understand this one sentence, then you understand what Bitcoin is all about. And today's session, we are going to absolutely understand each and every word of this single sentence. So don't worry if the words seem complicated right now, I'm going to make it really simple. So for that, let me quickly jump on to the concept of a hash function. 
because there are certain terms we need to understand and then we will go back to the abstract again so the first term that we need to understand is called a hash function i'm sure many of you have come across hash functions in day to day life like if you're downloading a software there's always something called a checksum or a hash which you are going to use to verify that a particular software which you are downloading is not tampered so what is a hash it's a one way mathematical function which means if i take an input like the word sanya in all small letters and i am using an example of something called sha256 it is going to give me a 64 character output but when i use the same word sanya in all caps while it is still giving me a 64 character output the output is completely changed if i take just one letter capital everything else small again the output completely changes so the first thing to remember in a hash function is when you change the output even by a little bit it completely changes the output when the input changes output changes then it is one way so if i give you this it is computationally infeasible for you to calculate the original for example i could take a 10000 page pdf or a one page doc and it is still going to give me 64 characters so how is anyone ever going to figure out that this 64 character relates to what and if you are able to reverse will we say that hash has been broken so in the past many hash functions have been broken at one time we used to use md2 that got broken md5 got broken sha1 got broken now we use sha256 and as technology improves hashes break and we use better and better hashes so is this part clear about what a one way hash function is are there any questions just put them in if there are no questions and it's all clear just write all clear so i know all of you are following me right so can you guys quickly give me an all clear so i'll go on to the next step i understand there may be a slight lag between what i'm saying and your response time so uh, that's the whole concept of hash and what it's giving you is a hexadecimal number that's a concept i'm going to go a little deeper into in some time what hexadecimal really means so to summarize a hash function takes an electronic record which could be a pdf a file a video an email and produces a fixed length output for example 64 characters different hashes different output size if the information is changed in any way even a comma is changed in a 3000 page document a different hash value is produced and it is computationally infeasible to calculate the original record from the hash now that we've understood hash let's go to the next step there is a concept called symmetric cryptography which means we can take any plain text hi hello a word document anything and we can encrypt it or jumble it or code it up so that nobody else can understand it and that jumbled version is what we call as a cipher text but the interesting part is the same key that you use to encrypt converting the plain text into cipher text the same key is used for decryption so when you look at a conventional lock at your home when you know you're using the key for your main door for example to your house it's the same key which locks the same key which unlocks so if somebody gets hold of your password or your key they can access your house or your document it's as simple as that but uh, somewhere in the 70s a very interesting new concept was invented which was called asymmetric encryption where a different key is used to lock the data and a different key is used to unlock it so if i wanted to send something to you that plain text so whatever secret message i want to send you i will use your public key to lock it up and send it to you and once you get that document only you can unlock it or decrypt it because it needs your private key to unlock so a different key to lock and a different key to unlock so how it works is in real life you will first use a software to create a key pair i'm going to show you what the software looks like a key pair which comprises two things a public key and a private key once you do that you will distribute your public key to the whole world through email through your website through whatever method you want but the private key you are going to keep only for yourself and when anybody in the world wants to send you a confidential message they lock it up using your public key send it to you and only you can unlock it using your private key 
and the same concept of public private key is also used in crypto transactions which is why this is a very important concept for us to understand uh someone's question is hash is longevity i didn't understand Preeti. can you explain what you mean by that now let's take the hash and asymmetric encryption into something called digital signatures now here there's no locking of data it's authentication of data so let's say that you wanted to file your income tax returns you now the government needs to understand who has actually sent this income tax return is it the correct person who is doing it i shouldn't be able to send your income tax return you should be able to send it so what happens in that case is you will take the original return that you've created let's say it's a word doc you will then digitally sign that using your private key and you will send this original text and the signed the signature you will send that to the government and they will use your public key to verify whether it is actually your signature or not now in reality you don't sign the actual original you sign the hash of it because the hash is much smaller so instead of trying to sign a hundred page document which would take time first the software makes the hash out of it which is just 64 character your private key interacts with it generates the signature so it's much faster and that's why we use a combination of hashing and asymmetric encryption to for digital signatures and as we saw in the bitcoin white paper they're saying that digital signatures is the core solution that they have actually developed so it's important for us to understand how that works any questions just put them in now this is practically what it would look like now although you are seeing alphanumeric text on your screen just remember everything is actually just a number for computers everything runs on numbers but human beings find it easier to look at alphabet so that's the reason it's sometimes displayed like that. now this is an example of an ecdsa private key what does ecdsa mean elliptical curve digital signature algorithm so you keep hearing about these algorithms all the time and it's very very important to understand what's happening with which algorithm so most cryptos today or most blockchain platforms when it comes to signing they use something called ecdsa elliptical curve digital signature it's a very interesting algorithm maybe in future we'll do a detailed session just on understanding how it works but for today just understand the name that's it so when i use ecdsa to create a private key and a public key this is kind of what they look like so just some jumble of stuff here which is just a number for the computer now suppose i take this statement by bruce lee i fear not the man blah 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 and i want to digitally sign it when this interacts with my private key this is the signature that is created now this is not secret or confidential so whenever i want someone to verify it i will send that person the sample data the signature this whole thing and my public or they could get my public key from say my website but i have to give them these three pieces of information and only then can they verify whether i have signed the document or not i hope the part's clear to all of you uh, so there's an interesting question whether 256 represents the uh, yeah that that's how it goes that's the reason we use those numbers yeah pretty uh, now let's go to the next one so now let's take an example i'm using a software here called gpg you can download it for free for mac and linux and windows so just download it if you want to try out how it works so when i go into that software and i say i want to generate a new key pair so i can put in a name of course i can put any other name if i want it can be fictional doesn't matter i can put in an email address i can also tick this button to upload the public key so there are certain key servers around the world where anybody in the world can upload public keys so if I take this, then when I finish the creation, it will also upload the key then. Then I can give some comments like what is this key for? I can choose which algorithm I want to use. So that's also an option. ECDSA is not supported by this software. It really works on something called RSA, which is one of the original ones, which stands for Rives Shamid Adelman. I can select the length. I can put an expiry date, which I can put like I put here of 2026. I can put a passphrase that means even if somebody gets my private key they cannot use it to sign or they cannot use it to verify or uh, you know unlock a document unless they have my passphrase so it's another level of security that i can build in once i fill this information i just click on generate key 
Now, once the key is generated, I can open it up in text to look at it, and it's just going to look like this bundle of alphanumeric code. It's basically a very large number. And this is what a private key would look like. Again, a very large number. Now, let's say once I've done this and I have the software running on my computer, I could just right click on any document on my computer and then I could choose what I want to do. I could sign it, verify it, encrypt it, decrypt it, whatever. When I do that, it shows, OK, these are the multiple keys you have. Which one do you want to use for this particular transaction? I do it. And now in this case, I've signed. So what it's done is it's created this signature. Now, when I want to send this by email to someone, I will send them my public key. I will send them the original document and I will send them this signature. And then they will use my public key. So they have downloaded the document. The icon looks different because it's been signed. So it'll show some kind of a key on the icon. And they will then say verify signature. And if it goes through properly, it's going to show as a positive verification. Otherwise, it will show that the verification has failed. And then I will not trust that document at all. So that's a very simple way in which this concept works. Now, let me see if you guys have questions. Uh, yes, it is. That's an interesting point that you've made. Yeah, that's how it goes. Any questions that you guys have? Let me just quickly scroll back now. Now that we've understood some of the keywords, right? Let's go back. Yeah, so after double spending, let's go back now to the introduction of the Bitcoin white paper. Now that we've understood some of the basic terms. So what they say that in the conventional world, completely non-reversible transactions are not really possible because there are always going to be disputes. A customer will a customer will want a charge back, you know, saying, oh, I didn't make this transaction or what I've received is not correct. So the transaction can be reversed by the bank or the credit card company. Now, because of this, that the fact that these financial institutions have to mediate in all transactions, it increases the cost of transaction. That's one problem. And secondly, merchants must be wary of their customers and they have to keep hassling people for more information because ultimately they may need to reject a transaction and a certain amount of fraud is accepted. So this is the current scenario. And that's the reason they need, they say that we need an electronic payment system based on cryptographic graphic proof and not on trust. And that's one of the very, very interesting innovations done that can be used mathematics for this kind of a system rather than trusting people. So they say that in this paper we propose, and now let's read this line again, a solution to the double spending problem. You know what that means? Using a peer-to-peer -peer distributed timestamp server to generate computational proof of the chronological order of transactions. So all transactions must go in a particular order, first in, first out kind of a situation. Some kind of computational proof is going to come in and the system will be secure as long as honest nodes collectively control more CPU power than any cooperating group of attacker nodes. So if you've ever heard of 51% attacks, that's what they mean here. In a 51% attack, more than 50% of the CPU power or computational power of the network is controlled by attackers. And then they can do all sorts of crazy things. So that's what the white paper is talking about here. Let me see if there are any other questions. Yeah, there's an interesting question here uh, by, uh, let me see, yeah. So can ECDSA be hacked? So that's a very good question. And over time, yes. Every hash algorithm, every digital signing algorithm in the long run does get broken. So either the code is compromised, the math is compromised, or then computers become so fast that they can brute force it. So yes, I'm sure in due time that will happen, but I'm sure by then we would have moved on to better and uh, less vulnerable kind of a algorithm. But yeah, I'm sure in due time that's going to happen. Now we come to a very interesting sentence. We define an electronic coin as a chain of digital signatures. So you know what a digital signature is. So the very definition of any electronic coin, especially Bitcoin, is a chain of digital signatures. So I want you all to understand that electronic coins or things like Bitcoin are not coins. 
remove the concept of currency notes and coins from your mind it is called bitcoin it is called an electronic coin but it is nothing like that it is actually simply a chain of digital signatures so if you actually look at all the data stored in the blockchain nowhere will you find balances written it is not written like that so like you know when you look at a bank ledger it has people's names account numbers and their balances no that's not how it works in the blockchain you will see a huge amount of matter you will see digital signatures you will see hashes you will see addresses but nowhere are you going to see balances those are calculated on the fly by wallets whole different concept so we're going to see how that really works so in your mind i want you to understand a bitcoin is a chain of digital signatures maintained on a public blockchain anybody in the world can set up a node download all that data and now you have those chain of digital signatures with you now each owner again now abstract concept you own a particular coin just theoretically each owner transfers the coin to the next by digitally signing a hash of the previous transaction and the public key of the next owner and adds this to the end of the coin so if we consider a coin to be a chain of digital signatures the last transaction or the last input is going to be what the owner putting some data there which is what public key of the owner plus digital signature created by signing the hash plus public key of the next owner so all this data is going to go in and a payee can verify the signature to verify the chain of ownership which is why very interestingly when we look at bitcoin and other blockchain transactions we can go back right to the first block and see all the transactions that have happened so for example if uh, you know a particular part, fraction of a bitcoin was used by some criminal they then paid it to someone else you can actually track the payment method which is why we have people like tumblers who will try to obfuscate this chain of transactions right because otherwise you will come to know who is actually dealing with those criminals so that's a problem also in the blockchain world that most blockchains like bitcoin and all you can trace all the ownership which is where privacy enhanced cryptocurrencies and blockchains come in so when we take an example of monero so that is the next level privacy enhanced so you cannot make out who's paying whom but in bitcoin and others it can be done uh, there's another question uh, what is quantum cryptography so we are basically talking about the next level when quantum computing comes in and computers become like multiple times more powerful than what they are and then what kind of cryptography would be needed at that time to handle it a lot of it is currently work in progress it doesn't really impact us today but yeah that's the kind of stuff that we will are working on any other questions so far i hope whatever i'm saying is making sense now let's just quickly have a look at this diagram and don't worry if it's still complicated we are going to go further and further and understand more so let's say that what happened here is owner 0 the first person now this is owner 1 then owner 2 then owner 3 so let's go to the middle one so when we look at this transaction this chain of digital signatures which is forming in front of your eyes so what is happening here so this initial transaction which happened the hash of that is coming here i mean it's coming into this picture then this owner to is public key is coming here and this is being hashed together and then we are using owner one's signature and this entire thing is being digitally signed and moving forward and the next owner can then verify and at any given point of time the blockchain can go back right up till the first block and verify this entire chain of digital signatures let's go deeper so we saw all this let me quickly yeah so now that all of this is done we come to the next part that okay suppose this chain of digital signatures is being created how is it being broadcast to everybody who's participating so again look at the green part here transactions must be publicly announced and we need a system for participants to agree on a single history of the order in which they were received very very critical so one of the questions that you know the bitcoin inventors had to solve was that okay suppose a lot of these transactions are happening how is the system going to work so that everybody comes to know and there is only one single history so sometimes you hear words like single source of truth you know you may have heard that a blockchain is a single source of truth what does that mean well that's the point that they are going to solve here 
so they say that one option is that we are going to use a timestamp server so what is a timestamp server going to do it is going to take a hash of a block of items put a timestamp on it and then widely publish the hash in a newspaper or on a usenet post now i know it doesn't make sense but they're just giving an idea that you know what maybe that's one method of doing it but then they give a better option they say that no newspapers and usenet posts are not going to work so we will use something called a proof of work system similar to adam back's hash cache now we are going to go deeper into the core part of bitcoin technology where we are going to talk about what proof of work really means so this proof of work is actually based on a system created by adam back it was called hash cache and when he created it it was not obviously for bitcoin it was in the 1990s it was created for the email world as well as for preventing distributed denial of service attacks but bitcoin took that technology and used it for this kind of an authentication and that's the reason we need to understand it in depth so first let's go to the basics let's say when this was invented the purpose was to prevent or reduce email spam now it's very easy for a spammer to just click and send out a billion emails how do we reduce that so what adam cash uh, suggested i forgot his name sorry adam back so what he suggested was that can we make the spammer work and then prove that he has done some work before actually accepting the email so anybody in the world who wants to send an email their computer has to do some mathematical calculation so if you're trying to send out a billion spam you will have to do billions of calculations which will slow you down and make spamming expensive so this is a simple example of what he suggested so let's look at it on the top here so let's take a sender of the email let's put some kind of a small separator then let's take the receiver another separator let's put a timestamp of when the email is being sent again a separator and a nonce or a number such that when these four items are put together and hashed the resulting hash must begin with a certain number of zeros and in this example i am saying it must begin with four zeros right so let's take an example let's say we take sanya at example.com as an input we put this small separator we put samaira at example.com as the receiver then we put the timestamp so although it looks like a number to you it's basically a timestamp in the unix format then we put another separator and we put the number zero the nonce zero now we take this entire string and run it through sha256 this is the hash output does it begin with four zeros no so now as a sender of the email i will do next calculation one so this zero which you see i have now made it one i again run it through the hash function now the result is again it is not starting with four zeros i will increase the nonce two three four five i will keep doing this till in this example i reach 16100 now when i run it through the hash it begins with four zeros and i can say this hash matches so now when i send the email out i am going to also send this nonce when you receive the email you need to do only one calculation put this entire string together and if the result begins with four zeros you can accept the email or your server will accept the email otherwise it will delete the email. I hope that's clear to all of you that that is how this concept is supposed to work now i have an interesting question here this four zeros is it defined by the email application very good question so yes this would be defined by whoever wants to use the system and in bitcoin also it works like this and this number of zeros is constantly changed and that is where we are going to come in some time to the concept called difficulty level so yeah that's a very good question let me head back to the paper so in this example i took four zeros in reality it could be a bigger number now remember infinite nonces can exist for any given string so if i continue the calculation after 16100 also many will come however i just need to calculate any one and send that across now calculating the correct nonce takes time takes computational power but verification is very simple because you are verifying only one number so that's why we say computing the nonce is not trivial but verification is trivial now let's take an example that for this particular string 
the first hash we came across was 161000 but 202312 also works it starts with four zeros 290121 also works starts with four zeros and the number of nonces which will work will be infinite we just need to calculate any one so that's the basic concept now suppose we were to implement this in an email server this is how it would work so if in your gmail account you click on the view original it shows you all the headers there you see there is something called a message id creation date time from to subject and then you will find something called spf sender policy framework dkim domain key internet management these are things used to check for uh, you know phishing and fake emails so there you will actually see things like pass with this ip address pass with this domain just one more line could be added it could be called pow which is proof of work and you could say pass with 89804 which in this example is the nonce your server would have checked with 89804 and if the nonce began with four zeros it would accept it and say this particular email has passed proof of work test it's not there i'm just giving you an example so as of today in bitcoin you will see it up to here but you will not see pow so although adam back created this for email no email service provider really started using this and the first real world application that we saw of this was the bitcoin blockchain any questions uh there is a question here which says uh, explain utxo i am going to come to utxo in some time when we talk about the various kinds of accounting models used in blockchains we'll come to it so give me some time now now that we have understood how adam back wanted hashcash to work now let's try to put it and understand a simplified version how proof of works in the blockchain work so every blockchain begins with block number 0 that's the first block and you know in programming we always start counting from 0 and not from 1 so just like the universe when it was initially created from the if we believe in the big bang theory that when the big bang happened at that time the laws of physics did not exist but as the universe started to form in milliseconds the laws of physics came into being similarly in a blockchain the first block which is also called the genesis block does not follow any rules because the blockchain doesn't exist so whoever creates the blockchain can put in certain rules in that and then from block number 1 onwards the rules are implemented now let's imagine that a blockchain has just started we are right now going to analyze block number 17 just random number i have taken what is a blockchain going to look like so simply put there are two parts the top part is what we call as the header and the bottom part is what we can say is the main data so when we look at the header of block 17 it would have previous hash that means the hash of some data of block 16 that would be one thing here then the time stamp of this particular block then the transaction route of all the transactions of this block i'm going to explain that in some time and a nonce so you remember what nonce was that 0 1 2 3 kind of a number and when these four things are put together and hashed the hash begins with a certain number of zeros only then we can say this nonce matches and then the world moves on to block number 18 so that's an overview now what is this transaction route simply put suppose there are four transactions which happened in the during block 17's time when it is being it is still not made so we would take each transaction calculate the hash put it here so four transactions means four hashes then we would take hash 1 and hash 2 combine it or concatenate it rehash we would get this 3 and 4 we would get this then we would take these two together concatenate again hash and this keeps going up till we are left with one hash which we call as the transaction route we can also call it the merkle root it's a term i'll introduce in some time so a blockchain is an ordered and time stamped record point number 1 so there is a fixed order block 17 knows which is block 16 block 18 knows which is block 17 because the hash of the previous block is embedded so if anyone tries to modify manipulate change <clears throat> the blockchain would identify that something's gone wrong then it is a time stamp record so as we can see time stamps are critical here it prevents double spending which means if you have a certain coin balance you cannot double spend you have 10 you cannot spend 
that's another thing that the blockchain will enforce and it prevents modification of previous records again by way of hash function so that in simple overview is what we mean by a proof of work blockchain now let's look at some other questions so the first question here is that in the real world is this concept used to filter spam and normal email no it is not used it was invented for that but it didn't really pick up they came out with other ways of doing it. Uh, in dnssec related to the last slide about email yeah so in some other technologies like i mentioned to you even when we talk about distributed denial of service so let's say multiple bots are trying to attack and bring down a site or a server so what happens at that time is that all these requests you can say do a proof of work calculation only then we will accept your request so that slows down the attackers uh, another interesting question is nonce can be anything and it is written by user i mean particular node owner yeah so we are going to go a little deeper into this but see nonce is a number right starting with zero going upward it's always going to be a number and i'm going to show you what the numbers actually look like also so there any other questions keep putting them now that we've understood proof of work let's go back here yeah, just give me a second yeah so when we look at this the proof of work involves scanning for a value that when hashed such as with sha 256 the hash begins with a number of zero bits so we've understood how that system works then we also say that when we are implementing proof of work we are incrementing a nonce in the block until a value is found that gives the blocks hash the required zero bits so again we saw how nonces are being incremented now the block cannot be changed without redoing the work so what we mean by that is that once a block is calculated if you want to replace it with another block you again have to recalculate all that work and in fact this is where a lot of people will find it surprising but let me in fact ask you a question do you think it's possible Today, you know, the Bitcoin blockchain has been running for more than 10 years. Is it possible to replace the entire Bitcoin blockchain with a new blockchain and nullify all the transactions of the past with a new set of transactions? Theoretically, is it possible? Practically, yes or no is a different issue. But what do you guys think? Theoretically, is that going to be possible? Try to give me an answer here. I'll give you a few seconds to think about that. Because when we look at the white paper, it's actually talking about something like that. It's saying something like uh, that the block cannot be changed without redoing the work. So logically, can we come to a conclusion that can the block be changed? Can the entire Bitcoin blockchain be actually replaced today? So one answer that I've received here from Jatin is that no, it will make a new chain and old chain will still be there. Okay. Anybody else wants to disagree with that? uh point of view so i would say yes it can be and not just that but you can actually replace the old chain and yeah while that may sound surprising i'm going to come to that part very soon about how that would really work but before that uh another issue that the bitcoin white paper looked at was that to compensate for increasing hardware speed you know so they realized that over time as bitcoin becomes popular hardware speed would keep increasing in the world people may or may not be interested in running nodes so how would this proof of work difficulty handle how would it change and that's where this concept of how many zeros would come comes into the picture that this proof of work difficulty would be determined by a moving average targeting an average number of blocks per hour so they said when bitcoin goes live the system would on its own detect how many blocks are being created per hour and based on that it would increase or decrease the proof of work the difficulty level so if blocks are getting generated too fast difficulty would increase if blocks are getting generated too slow difficulty would decrease so we are going to go into that now and see what do we mean by this concept of difficulty uh, in the meanwhile let me just take one interesting question Folks concept won't be there in updating. Very good point. In fact, that's the point that I'm going to explain to you later that sometimes or rather all the time there are actually multiple blockchains. 
and the system on its own is deleting the chains and keeping the longest. So I'm going to come to forking later. And uh, let me see if there's another question. Yeah, okay. Let me move on. Now we come to this concept called difficulty. Difficulty means how many times more difficult is it to mine a block now as compared to how difficult it was to mine the genesis block. So how difficult was it to mine the first block? Compared to that, how difficult is it to mine the block right now? That is what we call as difficulty. And difficulty measures how difficult it is to find a hash below a given target. Target is a number that a block hash must be below for the block to be added to the chain. Let's see what that means. For that, let's first understand this concept of hexadecimal. So now as human beings, we use the normal decimal system 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 onwards. It's decimal. Binary is zeros and ones. Hexadecimal is from 0 to 9, it's normally written as numbers. And then we write 10 as A, 11 as B, 12 as C, 13 as D, 14 as E, and 15 as F. So if we wanted to write 500, decimal 500 in hexadecimal is 1F4. Decimal 1000 is 3E8. Similarly, if you come across ABCDF in hexadecimal, it's actually this decimal number. 11259375. So I need you to understand a little bit of why hexadecimal, I mean, what it looks like. Because when we look at a hash, it is actually a hexadecimal number. Right? So I hope you've understood what hexadecimal means. Now let's see what a difficulty looks like. So suppose we say that right now, the current target on the Bitcoin blockchain is this. That actually means it is this number. So even though here it doesn't look like a number, please remember this is nothing but a number. And the number is this. Now a particular block has been hashed. And one of the miners says, I have successfully hashed it. And the hash is this. The system needs to check, is this number lower than this number? So when we look at it as human beings and we convert it to decimal, we realize that yes, this is a smaller number than this. It's got many more digits here. So this hash is correct. Whatever nonce was used to calculate this hash, that nonce is valid because the number of zeros is correct. So I hope that made sense to you. That's where this whole concept of number of, ze or number of zeros comes in. Now, who sets this target? This target is adjusted by the blockchain every 2016 blocks, which approximately happens every two weeks. Now, I want you to understand another concept. In the real world, when we talk about time, we are using based on longitudes, right? So we have something called the GMT or the Greenwich Mean Time. And based on that, different countries have their own time zones. But the blockchain world doesn't care about that timing. In the blockchain world, everything is measured in terms of blocks. Now, because a Bitcoin block on an average gets mined every 10 minutes, so we can say that every two weeks, approximately, we can say 2016 blocks get created and the target adjusts itself every 2016 blocks. It may even take a month sometimes, it may even take one week. Everything in the blockchain world is measured in terms of blocks. So when we say that the Bitcoin difficulty, sorry, the rewards of Bitcoin, you know, 50 per block, 25, it gets halved every four years. No, it's not actually four years. It's every certain number of blocks. So just like that, the target is automatically adjusted every 2016 blocks. So what the system does after every 2016 blocks, the algorithm sees that in the last 2016 blocks, how much time did it take on average to create a block? If it took an average of 10 minutes, the system says no change required. However, if it took 12 minutes, then the system realizes, oh, it's taking more time. It reduces the difficulty. If blocks have been created on an average six minutes per block, then the system says it's become easy. It increases the difficulty. So as the amount of computational power in the Bitcoin network goes up or down, that has an impact on the time it takes to mine a block. That then has an impact on the difficulty level. But of course, it's not instantaneous. It's after every 2016 blocks. 
uh, any questions okay i don't see questions here don't worry if you guys are finding some difficulty here go back relook at this video and i'm sure it will become clearer it takes time to get to understand some of these concepts right now that we've understood this now let's look at this network concept so for running the bitcoin network right there are about six steps that need to happen so when a new transaction comes in firstly point number one the new transaction needs to be broadcast to all the nodes now obviously it is never going to happen to 100 percent of the nodes it's on a best effort kind of basis because it's a peer-to-peer -peer network we're talking about it's not a centralized server that everyone connects to. so there is some method by which new transactions are broadcast then each node collects these new transactions into a block each node then works on finding a proof of work which basically means we know now that it's basically finding a number a nonce when a node finds a proof of work or finds the correct nonce it broadcasts this block to all the nodes saying you know what these this is the set of transactions in this particular order and when i calculated the nonce this nonce matches it based on the difficulty level right now on the network so it immediately broadcasts to everyone and remember every node is not working on the same set of transactions some miners can choose not to even use certain transactions lots of things can happen i'll come to that a little later but every node which finds a nonce immediately broadcasts now the nodes when they get this information they will accept the block only if all transactions in it are valid and not already spent which means double spending is not happening all the transactions are valid which means balances or were correct digital signatures were correctly put all of that if it matches only then they are going to accept it finally a node is going to express their interest or acceptance of the block by working on the next block right so let's say 100 of us are mining you find the correct nonce you broadcast it i will check it if i am convinced that okay all transactions are valid they are not already spent i will then say fine and i will simply accept your block and start the next calculation that's the only way i accept i don't need to tell you anything i just start working on it nodes always consider the longest chain to be the correct one which is what brings us to a very interesting concept that in any blockchain which is proof of work based at any given point of time there are multiple chains because all nodes don't get all the data now when multiple chains start to get formed next block also comes and suddenly you find there are 10 chains running after every few blocks the blockchain automatically would look at the longest chain and delete everything which is why it is possible that your transaction will get thrown out after some time so even though your transaction went through after some time your transaction gets rejected i know that sounds very strange but let me give you a real world example <clears throat> of that so several years ago i used to go to this particular coffee shop <clears throat> sorry and whenever i would go there they would ask how are you going to pay are you going to be paying are you going to be paying in paytm or upi that kind of a system or are you going to be paying using bitcoin and if i said bitcoin they would say first pay then go in and then we will give you a coffee if you said card or upi and all that kind of stuff they would give you the coffee first and take the payment in the end why because in bitcoin transactions it is possible that the transaction gets rejected later so we usually wait for one hour or six confirmations and on an average a confirmation or a block takes 10 minutes which is why we say wait for 60 minutes before you actually say the transaction has gone through and then you can be reasonably sure that the transaction will not get rejected however like i said it's possible that somebody could today come and replace the entire chain and all transactions could also get nullified but the practical possibility of that having is very very little yeah uh, i see an interesting question so let me take that how do nodes know which transactions to pick is there a flag to know which are already picked yeah that's a very good point here so all these transactions they basically go into something called the mempool or the memory pool so interesting question Seema. so they can pick up from there now you know in bitcoin you can pay a transaction fee but it is optional so a miner can say i will only pick those which are giving me maximum transaction fee i will neglect everything else 
that's also one thing that can happen secondly miners can do something called uh, transaction censoring where they will say i will not take transactions from a particular set of addresses it goes against the concept of decentralization but you know what decentralization is not what most people think it is ultimately it is still up to the miner to decide and if all the miners decide to block certain addresses there's nothing you can do so miners pick it up based on transaction fee miners pick it up based on addresses also so those are some of the things that they use now that we've understood all this it, they've also said new transaction broadcasts do not necessarily reach all nodes in due time they will but they don't necessarily need to reach which is why anybody who's in the bitcoin business and let's say you're running your own network you're running your own business on it you will always make sure you have your own full node which is also doing mining then what about the incentive now this is another very interesting thing by convention the first transaction in a block is a special transaction that starts a new coin owned by the creator of the block so when we look at all the transactions that are happening and we put them in an order the first transaction that every miner puts is a transaction giving his own address new bitcoins now when bitcoin started at that time for every block you used to get 50 after a certain number of blocks which is approx four years it came down to 25 then 12 and a half currently i think we are 6.25 this number will keep becoming half till the year 2140 ad again it's a prediction based on the number of blocks being created at 10 minutes average but when that happens no new bitcoin will be created because by halving it would have become virtually zero and at that time a total of 21 million blocks would be generated that is why we say that the maximum supply of bitcoin is 21 million because of this logic that every certain number of blocks you are having so by that time you will reach 21 million no new bitcoin will be created so that's the first transaction and this transaction is called a coinbase transaction don't confuse it with the crypto exchange called coinbase they took their name from this concept so this new bitcoin which you are getting is an incentive for the node to support the network and it is also a way for initial bitcoin to enter into circulation because when bitcoin started there was nothing it was zero how do we get new bitcoins by creating new ones so per block creating new ones so that in due time we have 21 million and then transaction fee takes over uh, this incentive also helps to encourage nodes to stay honest so because you have a vested interest in bitcoin you're holding coins so as a node if you attack the system the value of bitcoin goes to zero you will be the biggest loser so this new creation is also to encourage nodes to stay honest then there is an interesting concept called merkle tree so i explained it to you earlier that you know when we calculate hashes uh, hashes and we go up so it's kind of like a tree it's called a merkle tree so to explain what that means is that once the latest transaction in a coin is buried under enough blocks hundreds of blocks have passed for example the spent transactions before it can be discarded to save disk space so a full node would keep all the data but other nodes need it so there are various kinds of nodes so to facilitate this without breaking the hash we use this merkle tree where like i told you earlier we could have four transactions hash of each then hash 0 and hash 1 goes to form hash 0 1 hash 2 and hash 3 goes to form hash 2 3 and this goes on till we have one hash left that's called the root hash so this entire tree is called a merkle tree and the final thing which you have is called the merkle root simple concept so <clears throat> this is another example so ideally what a transaction would have is the sender or the spender that person's address receiver's address who have you made the payment to the name of an asset so here i'm not talking about bitcoin blockchain i'm talking about any other blockchain where you can create more coins or more assets like you know on ethereum you can create your own tokens but of course ethereum doesn't use proof of work anymore and let's say we were giving 25 sanya coins in this example this information put together is what transaction one is so we hash these four pieces of information and that's what becomes t1 t2 t3 t4 and that's how the system moves up <clears throat> let me check if there are any questions no no, no questions okay then uh, we have this concept called simplified payment verification 
it is possible to verify payments without running a full network node <clears throat> so as we can see a node a user only needs to keep a copy of the block headers of the longest proof of chain proof of work chain so while there are multiple chains you just look at the longest one and that's how you are going to actually use this uh, the verification is reliable as long as honest nodes control the network but if the attacker comes into the picture obviously problems begin and which is why it is always recommended that as a business if you are frequently using bitcoin or receiving payments run your own node now somebody had asked some time ago about this concept of utxo so let me explain what that means so let's take an example of when we do cash payments right <clears throat> let's look at a simple example there i have a 100 rupee note i go and buy something worth 80 rupees i give the 100 and the shopkeeper returns 20 rupees that's the way cash transaction works and that's how bitcoin actually works it's utxo where you actually pay more and then you get back change so i know it sounds a little silly but then it's actually a very efficient way of doing things however there are certain blockchains which work like credit card debit card that if you want to pay 222 rupees you will pay 222 rupees only bitcoin says no you pay more and you actually gets back some right so i think i've got a sound i've got a slide explain so primarily in the blockchain world we have two types of record keeping models one is the utxo which stands for unspent transaction output model which is used in bitcoin ethereum uses something called the account balance model so each bitcoin transaction spends output from previous transaction each bitcoin transaction generates new outputs which can be spent by transactions in the future which is why i told you when you look at the bitcoin blockchain you will not find balances anywhere you will find this humongous amount of chain of digital signatures and it is the job of your wallet to show you your balance in different addresses the blockchain doesn't actually do any of that so it is a bitcoin user's wallet that keeps track of all your unspent transactions associated with all the addresses owned by you i hope that part is clear so when we say what is the balance of my wallet so when you just open up your bitcoin wallet it will show you your balance say 1.3 bitcoin that is the total of all the addresses in your wallet their unspent transactions in real time are calculated and your balance is shown so like i told you utxo can be compared to spending bank notes and getting back change the benefits of utxo are scalability and privacy because the bitcoin white paper says for every transaction use new addresses and then you will get more privacy not the level of privacy that something like a monero would give you but still a lot more privacy so this is kind of what triple entry blockchain so if you are from an accounting background you must be you must have heard about the concept that initially the world used to use single entry then it moved on to double entry which is what the whole world uses today but blockchain brings in the concept of triple entry bookkeeping which is why we say that blockchain transactions do not need this reconciliation everything once a transaction goes through it is provably immutable and provable that there is no need for any kind of reconciliation which is what happens in the conventional world of accountancy but again if you're from an accounts background that would make sense to you otherwise it kind of won't uh, i have an interesting question here is that will different genesis blocks be there for different blockchains yes every single blockchain in the world would have its own genesis block now in fact even if if you look at forks so for example initially there was only bitcoin but then they wanted to upgrade the technology some people didn't agree so the bitcoin blockchain forked into two so at the time of the forking the block in which the forking happened that block became the genesis block for a new blockchain called bitcoin cash so because bitcoin cash is its own blockchain it has its own genesis which is a particular block of the bitcoin blockchain because that's where it originated from right uh, i have another question here where does this data go how is the relationship between the actual data stored and the transactions so well that's the job of the blockchain 
software or the algorithms or the programming it's what does that now if when a company or product wants to start using blockchain technology for some use cases for demonstrating a chain of trust do they need to create a new blockchain of their own now, that's a very good question it will depend upon your use case totally right just give me a second so it would depend on what you're trying to do but yes in some cases you may want to even set up a private blockchain in some cases you may want to use an existing one in some cases you may want to fork one so i can't answer that question till i know what your exact use case is yeah let me head back here so yeah. uh now let's talk a little bit about privacy so while they understand that the traditional banking model achieves a level of privacy by restricting access to information of the parties involved so for example if there is a transaction in which you pay me or i pay you only the two of us know that okay a transaction between you and me these are our two account numbers this is the amount and then of course the bank knows but other people don't come to know other bank uh, customers do not know about other transactions so that's a level of privacy that the banking world has however you can bring in some level of transparency into the blockchain provided you keep using different keys and you keep your public key anonymous if you post your public key to the world then anybody can see all the transactions that you have done but again everybody doesn't want this privacy so that's totally your call and that is why they say a new key pair should be used for each transaction generating key pairs doesn't need you don't even need to be connected to the internet to do it and there is obviously no charge and you can do it in real time you can create as many as you want any questions so far now we are going to come to the final part of the paper which is usually what people find very complicated but it's actually very easy they have talked about certain calculations that they are looking at a scenario where there is an attacker trying to generate an alternative chain faster than the honest chain okay so this is the worst case scenario which i said you know can we replace the entire chain so they are going to use probability and mathematical calculations to show you how easy or difficult that could be <clears throat> so there is an attacker so, <clears throat> so there is an attacker who is trying to change transactions that means in the real chain he has spent money but he wants to now overwrite those transactions so when we look at this so the race between the honest chain and the attacker chain so you know we are constantly mining so there's a calculation going calculation war going on who gets nonces first so there are two chains running the honest chain and the attacker chain <clears throat> so we call this as a binomial random walk where we say that the success event is the honest chain being extended by one block and increasing its lead by plus one the failure event is the attacker's chain being extended by one block reducing the gap by minus one so suppose the honest chain is 10 blocks ahead and the attacker manages to do one block that means he has reduced the gap from 10 to 9 so the gap is reduced by one the probability of an attacker catching up from a given deficit is analog as if compared it to the gambler's ruin problem that suppose there is a gambler with unlimited credit who starts at a negative number and plays an infinite number of trials to reach zero or break even so we can calculate the probability that that gambler will ever get break even or when an attacker catches up with the honest chain using this standard formula so we are going to say p is equal to the probability of an honest node finding the next block q is the probability of the attacker finding the next block and qz is the probability that the attacker will catch up depending upon z number of blocks that he is behind us right so when we look at this formula so we say okay what is this probability now if p is less than or equal to q which means the probability of an honest block find succeeding is less than or equal to probability of the attacker then we are 100% sure the attacker will break the chain so the probability is 1 and in due time definitely the attacker will catch up however if the probability of the honest block is higher then what is the probability that you will the attacker catches up that is 
q raised to q divided by p raised to z so that's what the actual formula is right so i think yeah so then what they do is they've just given you the standard math so if you could just you know you can use up any of these online uh, calculators and just enter this sigma k 0 to infinity and you just enter this data and you can put different values for p q and z and then it will just simply give you the answer so this is the formula that you are going to use and these are the numbers that they have actually run so they've gone with an example of cubing 0.1 or cubing 0.2 and then the attacker is behind by how many blocks so by 0 1 2 3 and then based on that they are giving you the probability so if the attacker is zero blocks behind then they definitely he is going to catch up so the probability is one but if that person is even one block behind probability of catching up goes to 0.2 two blocks behind it goes to 0.05 three blocks 0.01 four blocks 0.003 Ten blocks, it goes to point zero 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 one two. So you realize, as the number of blocks lead that you have, that lead increases, the probability of the attacker catching up exponentially drops, and that's the whole meaning of the calculation. So you can ignore that entire part of the white paper, but a lot of people think that that's important to understand. It's not. It's simply probability calculations. So you can choose to ignore them, right? so now to conclude and then i'll take your questions what the white paper proposes is a system for electronic transactions without relying upon trust we are relying upon cryptography then they are saying that it is computationally impractical for a attacker to change the blocks or the public history of transactions if the honest nodes control a majority of cpu power and that's very very important so if you've heard about a crypto or a blockchain called bitcoin sv which stands for bitcoin satoshi vision that's another fork of bitcoin i think last year they had two successful 51% attacks where the attackers controlled a majority of the computational power and they were able to actually carry out a successful 51% attack till today it has not happened to bitcoin it could happen in the future but it has not happened so another important thing nodes can leave and rejoin the network at will accepting the proof of work chain as proof of what happened when they were gone so let's say i am running a node for some reason for 10 days my node is shut when i rejoin on the 11th day i will first download all the accumulated data and then start the process of being part of the mining so i will take the longest chain at the time when i reconnect as the honest proof of truth so we always look at the honest chain are there any questions yeah i can see some questions let me look at some of them okay can this be a use case for blockchain that i want to copyright my social media post to prove that i am the only original author of the post any way public open source blockchain api accessible for such small use cases yes you can uh so what you can do in this case is in fact some people have even put their love letters on to the bitcoin blockchain where uh every block has support for a small amount of data what we call as metadata so you could definitely put some hash into that yes it's possible for you to do that although bitcoin may not be the best way to do it there are other chains that you could use which can be used for that there is another interesting question um one second it's a longer question so i can't read it let me just try here uh by lightning network layer 2 in case of bitcoin yeah sure so uh to explain to you briefly what lightning network means is that when you look at uh, let's take an example of el salvador where they say that you can go and buy a burger using bitcoin now obviously mcdonald's is not going to wait for 60 minutes for a transaction to go through you know i told you that coffee shop example earlier so now suppose this is let me just stop sharing my screen for a second yeah okay so uh, let me try to explain this to you so say this is the bitcoin blockchain and this is slow because blocks are mined every 10 minutes only now suppose i create a parallel chain which is called the lightning network or an l2 a layer 2 like you know in the world of ethereum we say polygon is layer 2 so this is layer 2 so layer 2 is where transactions are actually happening they could bundle 10000 transactions and keep it with themselves and then push one hash or one transaction onto bitcoin so the use case that we you have of storing your hashes that could be done at layer 2 
and then from time to time that layer 2 pushes something onto layer 1 so that's how the lightning network or the liquid protocol also works these are layer 2s to bitcoin to the layer 1 now in the long run ideally blockchain technology should reach a level where we do not need layer 2s so bitcoin uh, ethereum is actually going in that direction where they're coming out with a lot of innovative upgrades like sharding and other things that in the long run you will not need a layer 2 i hope in the long run, you will not need a layer two for Bitcoin also. Is that part clear? Any questions? Uh, someone else has a question here. Are there any chances for the unspent transaction output to be spent on the same spending address and not creating new addresses? Yes, that can be configured. Uh, is Merkle tree used for all words in word files? I didn't understand the question, Jatin, so you'll have to re-put that. Uh, another question is why Merkle tree is important? Yeah. So as I explained during the white paper, it's to reclaim disk space and to reduce the amount of storage of data that is happening. So instead of storing huge amounts of data, see the bin has already crossed hundreds of GBs of data. And in future, it could go to TBs. So to reduce the amount of data, you know, that's where Merkle tree is stepping. Okay. I don't see okay there's a question about where can i learn more about layer one and layer two so i have a blog post which is on the basics of blockchain technology so it, it, it kind of covers everything that you would need let me just quickly open that up for you and i'll share the link with all of you there's a long blog post about blockchain terms and concepts so all this layer one layer two and everything is covered i'm putting that in the chat so you guys should be able to see that uh, someone's asked where are the people posting questions at so I guess you're posting it either on YouTube LinkedIn or Twitter those are the three places that I'm currently live on so I hope that answers your question if you use new addresses for each transaction doesn't that give an auditable history of every transaction anyway well people have to come to know which is your address so I know one address of yours somebody else knows another one but nobody knows all your addresses so that's the best you can do now, if someone was doing illegal stuff, they would use tumblers, which would completely mess up and nobody really comes to know what happens after that. But that's not relevant here. But anyway, we've got a lot more to cover. So please don't go yet. We are still a lot more points to cover. Yeah. So let me just go back to the presentation. Yeah. So now if we look at a particular block, so I'm giving you an example of block number 726468. So when we go to a blockchain explorer, it tells us for any given block that this block was mined on and it gives us a date 25th July at 6.38 p.m. GMT by so-and-so miner. Now, nowadays a lot of the mining is actually done by the mining pools. It currently has 430 confirmations on the Bitcoin blockchain. What does that mean? It means after that block, 430 new blocks have come in. That means there are 430 blocks which have confirmed the earlier block. How do we confirm an earlier block as a miner? By continuing to build the next block. So whenever I had taken this screenshot somewhere last year, at that point, 430 new blocks had come. The miners of this block had earned 6.25 Bitcoin. So as you know, the reward started from 50, kept going down. Currently, they're at 6.25 <clears throat> which at that time was 143,000 dollars the reward consisted of this base reward of 6.25 with an additional 0.17 of the reward or the transaction fee so this a total of this much of bitcoin was sent in the block with the average transaction being 27.65 bitcoins so this is all the data that we get the hash of that block was this the confirmations at the time when i went to the explorer was this this was the timestamp Height means the number of the block. This is the name of the miner. Number of transactions in that block were 2479. The difficulty level, if you recall difficulty, this is the difficulty. This was the Merkle root. So all the data about the block is visible. The version number, the size, the nonce. So you remember we talked about nonces being numbers. So the nonce was this. Transaction volume, block reward, fee reward. Okay. Now, uh, let me see if there are questions. So the question is, how many words in a word file get hash of all the words? Getting one hash of file. 
so when we calculate the hash of a file we take the entirety of that file to calculate that so as an individual is it possible for a small amount of bitcoin by mining or verifying from a good question do you know that you can actually mine bitcoin using a pen and paper you don't even need a computer so there's a very interesting blog post which i think i've shared the link in this blog where you can actually use pen and paper to calculate and mine a block of course not practical today but when the bitcoin blockchain just started so in fact my first introduction to bitcoin i did some mining you could use a laptop at that time to do it because there was hardly any competition of course as you know my sad story i deleted those bitcoin or rather i deleted all my private keys because i never really thought bitcoin would become so valuable right at that time you could do laptops today you need really powerful computers because the competition is very high you could still try with a laptop but the probability of you succeeding is very very low so which is why people nowadays even get together as pools and do the mining uh someone says amar says why bitcoin is sticking to proof of the uh, work and not moving why should it move honestly speaking i come from a background in cyber security and the number one point we look at is has a particular technology stood the test of time the older it is and if it runs without breaking the more i trust it proof of stake is very new proof of work is very old and from day one bitcoin is running on proof of work thousands of people have tried to attack it no one succeeded um, very few successes and they didn't even break proof of work they broke something else so proof of work is very very secure so i see no reason why bitcoin should actually move from it. let me go back to this so when we look at a block header i initially explained it to you in a brief way but if you go deeper firstly it has the version number so when you upgrade a software the version number changes hash of the previous block the 256 bit hash of the previous block this changes every time a new block comes in hash merkle root so this is the 256 bit hash on based on all the transactions of that block so every time a transaction is accepted that particular field in changes the time as second since this time so we use the unix time stamp there bits the nones we know what that is now let's look at block 0 so this was the genesis block this was mined on 3rd of january 2009 at this particular time by we don't know who at the time when i took this screenshot these were the number of confirmations on it the miner got 50 bitcoin as a reward there was obviously no transaction because there was zero transaction that actually happened it was just a base reward of 50 and then you can see the number of transactions one now which is this this was the transaction of getting the base reward difficulty level was one that is why i told you when we calculate difficulty level today it is comparable to how difficult was it to mine the first block first block difficulty was always considered one merkle root all these other thing we can see the nones so that was kind of it now there's one last concept i want to do cover which is that there's something called a reorganize so a blockchain reorganize happens when one chain becomes longer than the one you are working on so suppose you are working on so there are six chains running at this time and that happens all the time in blockchain so let's say six chains are running you are working on this but some other chain has become longer than yours that's the time your chain is going to be dropped so all the blocks in the old chain that are not in the new one will become orphan blocks and their generations is invalidated transaction that use the newly invalidated generated coins also become invalid because you may have gotten the reward in that but that whole chain is now cancelled so your reward also is cancelled right and that is where chain splits happen so the number of confirmations for transactions may change after a reorg because your transaction is in a block then you got one confirmation two and then your whole block vanished now your transaction has gone to another block and maybe three confirmations have happened so that is why transactions that are not in the new chain will become unconfirmed and yeah that's a scary concept but unfortunately that's the way it works so if a transaction in the old chain conflicts with a transaction in the new chain the old one becomes invalid otherwise it would become double spent okay that's about all that i had so let me stop sharing 
you guys have any questions i can take them now so for those of you who liked it thank you so much for your comments here how does a node validate the actual balance available on the wallet public address so that the block can be confirmed is there a common node which maintains balances for each no that there, there is no public node and all nodes don't even have information nodes are of very different types so all nodes don't even keep all the information so i want you guys to look at so the i posted uh, something which is the link to a blog post have a look at it that will actually help you to understand all these various concepts that we discussed today i am also sharing the link to the whatsapp group it's a whatsapp community for blockchain so join that and then you know you'll get notified i'll tell you what all i'm doing i also do lots of quizzes i am also starting something called the blockchain engineering program it's a pre course and that's going to go deep not into blockchain development or web3 development it's from the node perspective so you don't have to have a software background to do that uh, course so you're welcome to join it's a free course starting off in june so you just have to sign up for my mailing uh, this whatsapp group and everything will be available uh, let me see some of your other questions explain the concept like bitcoin uses forks uh so like i said when we talk about forks so there's this chain going straight bitcoins going then a bunch of people say we want to change the technology bunch says no so at a given point the chain breaks into two who have so like whoever had bitcoin at the time of the first split you would get that many bitcoin cash free so if you had one bitcoin at the time of the split you automatically got got one bitcoin cash free the same address works on both the blockchain so while a bitcoin address does not work on the ethereum blockchain a bitcoin address will work on bitcoin cash blockchain because they have both come from the same place in ethereum the split happened many years ago when uh, the ethereum dao hack took place i'll do that in another session at that time it split into two there's ethereum and there is ethereum classic the original version is called etc ethereum classic the new version is called eth so that split happened you immediately doubled your crypto on both and the same address works on both places again the ethereum blockchain split recently when it moves from proof of stake to proof of work some people didn't want the move so eth pow is the uh, chain which did not move to proof of stake and eth is the one that moved uh, any hacks happen in pos network system yeah actually some of them do keep happening from time to time is there any coding in that program no there is no coding so the blockchain engineering program is not for coding it's for network setups setting up nodes securing nodes so it's more from that point so if you are interested in programming the i i run different courses in that this is only for the nodes and blockchain engineer so just join the whatsapp group and you'll be part of the whole thing so if you join up the blog also you can read the post on it is a bridge also a blockchain no so amar a bridge is not a blockchain a bridge actually connects two blockchains and tries to make them interoperable with each other but a bridge in itself is not a blockchain again in that blog post i have written more stuff about it any other questions okay so i enjoyed having this session with you guys i hope you found it useful you can go through the recording later and i'll see you in my next session i'm usually live on these sessions every friday or saturday yeah take care bye bye